afternoon ladies and gentlemen how's everyone doing i hope everyone is fully recharged after the lunch break and who's ready to begin the second and the last session of the day may i hear some voice okay thank you all right everyone this will be the second and last session of the day but before we begin i would like to remind the audience once again that all of the papers that are being discussed in our session today can be accessed online. Just scan the barcode available on the screen shortly. And by scanning this barcode, you can gain access to all of the papers being discussed in our session today and tomorrow. Second thing to remind is there's still a goodie bag available outside for one person each. However, you need to fill the feedback form first. Uh, by also scanning another barcode for the feedback form and to follow the Instagrams of CSIS and SAIL. The Instagram username, remember, is at CSIS Indonesia and at Safety Inet Lab. So fill the feedback form, follow the Instagrams, and you can get yourself a goodie bag. You get a goodie bag, you get a goodie bag, you get a goodie bag. <laughs> Okay, so without further ado everyone, um, to wrap up the last session of the day, there will be a next discussion titled Technological Challenges and Innovations in Combating Disinformation. Leading and moderating our second session of the day is Ms. Dientia Andani, a teaching staff member of the Product Design Engineering Program, Prasetya Mulia University. Ms. Andani received a PhD in philosophy from Kanazawa University and a Bachelor of Design from Bandung Institute of Technology. Her areas of expertise lie in the fields of design, sustainability, humanities, and entrepreneurship. And she is currently researching the relationship between product integration and interaction design and its application with technology. I would like to call upon the stage, uh, Ms. Dientia, please give a pause to our moderator. Reminder again to the audience that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the speaking, but if the time allows. Uh, so to everyone who wants to give your question, please raise your hand and the moderator will call upon your name. And please state your name, your affiliation and keep your questions short and straightforward to give rooms for more questions. Okay, Miss um, Dientia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Miss Johanna. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, thanks you so much for attending the second panel for today. So we will discuss a lot about technological challenges and innovation in combating this information. So now allow me to invite our distinguished panelists. The first one is Mr. Predipta Sokarana from Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. Please welcome. Okay. Now I will invite our second panelist, Mr. Stefanus Wisnu Wijaya from Universitas Prasetya Mulia. Please welcome. Now, I will invite our third panelist, Mr. Matthew Fasciani from University of Notre Dame. Please welcome. And yeah, I'll also introduce and invite maybe our last panelist, Ms. Elsa Hestriana, who will join us via Zoom. Hello, Ms. Hestriana. Good afternoon. Can you hear our voice clearly? Oh, we still haven't hear your voice here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we can. Send. Okay. Thank you so much, Miss uh, Hestriana. Uh, so now I'd like to invite all attendants to give a round of applause for all of our panelists. Uh, now, before we start the session, uh, I'd like to remind you all, the session will be 15 minutes for all presenters. I will remind you for the last five minutes. And after that, I uh, will be continuing with another panelist and we will have 
the Q&A session on the last. Okay, so everyone will give the presentation first and we will have the Q&A on the last session. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to invite Ms. Pradipta Sokrana to give presentation uh, today. Thank you uh, for the moderator. So, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Predipta Socharana. On a daily basis, I'm currently working in the Ministry of Communication and Informatics, but please do note that none of this presentation represents any of my employer's uh, view and opinion. So, it is purely uh, my, my, my work. But, of course, um, so some of the background and context for this um, uh, writings and uh, discussion is more uh, represent of what I do uh, on daily basis. I am part of the uh, ministry team that uh, also oversees the hoax debunking effort of the ministry, which uh, I am exposed to many of the disinformation and hoaxes, as well as an effort to counter disinformation, which one of the measures is to um, issue some debunking report. And we, of course, collaborated with some fact-checking fact initiative in Indonesia, and this is somehow the reflection that, that I have in carrying out the daily tasks that I am uh, assigned to. So without further ado, um, the discussion today will focus on facing a flood of lies and finding the impact of source uh, choices on reliability in Indonesia hoax debunking activities. So while the focus of this um, finding and discussion more on the ch choices of sources when a fact-checker uh, made its debunking report. Some of this also attributed to the current technology uh, challenge happened thanks to uh, artificial intelligence and deep fake. So I will not bore you with the outline of the discussion as I can, I believe you can also see it in my paper. But, okay, so they, 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 all of this started when, I, when we see uh, recent uh, development of technology about deep fake where even video of our uh, head of state can be uh, disrupted and doctored, where, of course, it will be more challenging for a fact checker to identify whether this is accurate or not. So, despite of this technological challenge, even before this was very uh, hype and very trending now, um, we also know that during COVID-19, a lot of people became, fight, became victim of the disinformation. So rather to go to hospital and uh, receive treatment on their uh, COVID-19, they believe that the oh, hospital actually made up the COVID-19 itself. I do not want to get vaccinated and so on. So people die, right? And this also represents how challenging the effort of fact checkers to convince that such information is wrong. This information is false. Trust our counter disinformation. But apparently, for some part of it, it did not work. Still, people became victim of this condition. So, now the question is, why uh, we need to increase the reliability? Because the first one, we like it or not, whether we like it or not, our society remains doubtful on the information that we consume. As we know that the current algorithm of a social media platform can create echo chamber where people can uh, see the preference, the preferred content and information they want. So to challenge that is something very tough to do. So the first task why we need to increase the reliability is because we want to make people trust that our information, our debunking report is reliable. The second one is also to protect the fact checker themselves. From the discussion I had from, the, uh, from some public, uh, publicly available news and media, fact checker also prone to threat, assault, whether in digital uh, sphere or in offline sphere. So, one of the cases that I mentioned was, uh, ha it was happened in Spain where a uh, fact-checking organization was digitally assaulted by some of other political entity. Of course, we do not want that to happen here, especially because we are now facing the general election 2024. However, there was some concern back in 2020, 2021 during COVID-19 that the fact-checkers are eventually exhausted due to the flood of disinformation happened. And of course, there were also some conditions where they are, well, they, some of their accounts were also hacked 
and cannot function normally. So these are actually uh, the two reasons why we need to increase the reliability. Not to mention uh, uh, part of the fact checker protection also, the debunking report itself represents the fact checking organization and the individual who fact check the disinformation. So those are basically the two reasons why uh, we need to increase that. But how? Before delving into how, um, in, this, in this writing also dissect the anatomy of uh, a hoax debunking report. Unfortunately, correct, please, please uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong and this is the purpose of this forum is to also provide insight and uh, make some revision to this finding. There has been no uh, agreed uniform convention or agreed uniform practice or a great uniform informal, uh, how a debunking report is made. Nonetheless, in practice, we can see that there are four main parts of a, debunk of a debunking report. First one is the information on the issuing organizer. As we know that we have uh, Mafindo, we have uh, uh, checkfakta.com, we have colleagues in media like Liputan 6, Tempo, and so on, who, the, who are doing fact-checking activities where they provide the information or that this has been fact-checked by the, their organization. Some of them also include the information on the fact-checker identity themselves. The second one is to have the alleged false information within the hoax debunking report. So a screenshot, a snippet, a link, a reference or explanation on the hoax debunking report, I'm sorry, on the false information is provided within the hoax debunking report themselves. And the third one will be the challenge, uh, will be the creme de la creme, is the counter narrative itself, or the clarification the fact checker try to provide. This can be done through citing a direct references, or making an analysis from indirect references, and making a deduction from an existing information. So these are basically the practice of the providing clarification. And the last one is the sources or reference uh, to support the debunk report. Normally, this can be uh, the sources to the false information itself. Some of the fact checkers also make the uh, false information into permanent uh, URL using perma.cc. And some of them also <clears throat> make a reference to the uh, original article or some sources of the uh, clarification. Okay, now becoming to the, uh, now come to the main part of the discussion about the choice of sources itself. As it has been mentioned that the choice of source is part of the main idea of providing clarification in a hoax debunking report. Nonetheless, there are, based on the observation I made, there are at least three major type or categories of how a clarification is made. The first one is using the citing direct clarification. So for instance, if an individual uh, has been claimed to issue a false statement, such individual will issue a clarification directly. Or if a government entity or business entity or other type of organization issues a false claim to be uh, made of false uh, information, they can, uh, they can use or they can issue clarification that such information is wrong. We have seen that a lot. Uh, second one, to cite direct information contravening with the false narrative. This uh, refers to the information that has exists before the false information circulated. This can be done in a legal text, some previous debunking report, or some other official statement that actually not uh, mentioning about the false information directly, but can be assessed and can be, can be uh, trusted to challenge and provide clarification on the false information. The last one, actually, this will be the uh, most challenging one. It is very understood that this, this, uh, the, th the third one, the cl uh, claim uh, narrative is false. The one, is, uh, the one analysis saying that, oh, this narrative is false because there is no supporting information on this. So the, anal so the fact checker made a deduction from the existing information. Nonetheless, there is no exact reference to that false narrative. So this one is uh, probably would be the most challenging one because this type of clarification put the fact-checking uh, being liable to what they said. Nonetheless, of course, it is understood that this condition has to happen given that not all, the inter not all of the information are provided, but the disinformation need to be countered. So the third one basically 
one of the conditions where reliability actually needs to, to be improved in order to gain trust and, of course, to protect the uh, fact checker themselves. So how to, to bridge the gap between the, the reliability issues on fact checking activities uh, that, that has been exist? The first one to, uh, to create a better credential and for more recognition. I'm, from what I have heard, from what I learned, there has been a lot of effort and advocacy to protect the fact checker because many of them have been uh, targeted, as I mentioned, from uh, digital uh, threats and so on. And there has been also effort to provide, to obtain a credential among them by being part of the International Fact Checking Network. This is a good start. Nonetheless, a lot of effort needs to still be carried out, especially because some of the people in Indonesia may not know what is IFCN. Some, even some of the people say that, oh, I, not, I do not believe the, 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 the mainstream media. I do not believe the uh, news media that I have now, let alone they know about the IFCN. So there is a need for credential and localizing the IFCN itself. So by, 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 by localizing this, the credential and say that, oh, we have a uniform and we have a better rules and accountability, it will help the case better for them, for the fact-checking to say that, oh, we are actually in this together and we can have, help to verify one uh, to another. This also goes to the, um, the third one, to make sure that the campaign on trusting credible sources, not just limited to government uh, channels, not limited to the official channels from the uh, corporation, but also to the debunking report. One of the overlook or the oversight uh, in the effort of uh, countering this information is that the narrative always mentioned that, oh, when you use credible sources, go to the news media side and go to the uh, government side or the company side and so on. But sometimes you overlook that the fact-checking initiative also provide a credible sources. The last one will be to have five minutes, right? One slide. Uh, and also for audience, please pay attention. Okay, we can hear this voice. Please and please. last one would be the stronger collaboration. So by staying, quote unquote, staying alive, making collaboration, the fact-checking initiative can still be seen and can exist and have a sustainable presence. Thus, it can increase the trust and reliability from the audience. So last one, as I mentioned, the conclusion is, um, I will not read all of this because it will, uh, of course, uh, exhaust the time. But the idea is there is a gap that needs to increase that to be close and to be bridged in the effort of countering this information. As we now entering a um, general election year, it is very politically, well, it's not exactly clear the parties that is um, quote unquote attacking one to another. Unlike COVID-19 when we know there is a um, COVID denials, COVID deniers and COVID quote unquote believers, we do not have such situation in in the current political context. It is thus necessary for the effort of countering this information to be able to provide a more reliable and to gain trust. So the effort to counter any disinformation that may be politically motivated can be made more in more comprehensive and can help to strengthen our democracy. I think that would be uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Sokarana. Please give applause to him. Yeah, such a, yeah, it's very, very insightful, and yeah, you can give the presentation in the precise time. Uh, so before we go to Q and A uh, for audience, if you have any question, we will have the session after this. Uh, okay, now I will invite Mr. Stefanus Wisnuwijaya as our second panelist to give your presentation, please. Okay, thank you so much, Putia. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, attending my presentation today. And hopefully, after after lunch session, it's very challenging because mostly <laughs> mostly uh, Indonesian feel sleepy because uh, you have a very good uh, lunch right now. Okay. Uh, let me 
to present about uh, our small research on combating hoax or disinformation. We are doing a small research in Prasetya Mulia University to identify the pattern of how people reading pattern when they interact with hoax or misinformation. So it will be answer and provide understanding how we are respond, how we read of hoax in the social media platforms. Right now, there are three groups of efforts, research, research effort to combating hoax or misinformation. The first one is to develop the first group does not it does not work. It's okay. Yeah. The first group is in the development of automatic tool to detect and the circulation pattern of hoax or misinformation in digital platform. It aims to develop the automatic tools. The second one is in the area of human computer interaction. This is what we are doing right now. And the last one, it is related with Pa uh, from Mencom Info, doing about digital literacy and public policy development especially in this research focus on the developing appropriate digital literacy approach to combating hoax. And we are working in the second group of efforts in the area of human computer interactions. So this is what we are doing right now. We use eye tracking tool. We use eye tracking tool to identifying the pattern of people, users, with 12 participants from students in Prastia Mulia University, so it is can see, we invite them to read box and fact information and then compare it. We use eye tracker tool from Topi and then uh, we identify the case plot and heat map. So we have the data, the data on how they read the hoax and how they read the fact. We use X or Twitter in this research, but it is imitation of X or Twitter. It is not the actual X or Twitter. So we we used to. I think it's broken. Yeah. So, what is the findings? This is the findings. Actually, there is no significant differences when people read hoax or facts. Mostly, mostly the students focus to the textual textual speed information like this. They spend most of the time in the textual information. This is the textual information. This is the textual information too. This is the textual information. This is the textual information. This is fact. This is misinformation. The pattern is not significantly differences. They put attention to scrutinize the textual information and then scan the visual element of the information. But there is a difference on how long they absorb the information. I think it is because of the content. 
of the textual information is difference between the fact and the hoax. The screen scrutinize all of the textual information. Mostly, uh, in average, they took almost 10 seconds to read all of the fact information before they decide to do something. Before they click next or share or everything. But they only need four until five seconds when they interact with the hoax or misinformation here. It is faster. They start to read the text while starting from the title. Sorry starting from the name of the account and then move to the title and then scan the visual and then move into the next information again. The pattern is the same. The difference is we found in 12 participants, the difference is only on the average time needed to read the information. It is longer to read the hot, uh, sorry, to read the fact information. It is faster. So this is the differences. The pattern is there is no significant difference in pattern, reading pattern, but there is significant differences in the time they need to read all of the information. But this research is limited in the number of participants. We invited 12 participants from students, so all of them is Gen Z, student in Prastia Mulya University. And we are not doing the research in the natural environments. We invite them to uh, doing the research in our laboratory. So it could be different if we are doing the research in the natural environment, but I don't know. We have no data about if we are doing the research in the natural environment. Okay, so uh, I think that we need to uh, develop this research further in terms of adding more participants to get uh, more data in terms of maybe we can add different type of hoax or misinformation and different type of information, fact information also different categories of participants because it is a very, very small number of participants and only one type of fact or misinformation. Okay. I think uh, it is enough. 10 minutes, less than 15 minutes, with you? Less than 10 minutes, sir. Oh, less than 10 minutes. Because when I went to my PhD, there is three minute thesis competitions. So now almost 10 minutes. So I, I am the winner. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yes, you're the winner if you, if, if you talk about thank short you, term. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stefanos Wisnowijaya for your presentation. Okay, so since we still have some time, I will um, wrap up a bit about the previous two presenter. So from Mr. Sokarna, we have discussed about debunking. Am I right? Yeah, that's the effort of debunking. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you're experienced in it since your background is from the Ministry of... Yeah, you're from Mencom Info. And from Mr. Stefanus Wijaya, we discussed about how to recognizing the disinformation. And you are using eye tracking. Am I right, Mr. Wijaya? 
Yes, yeah. Uh, and we are using the eye tracking tools to recognize the misinformation on the social media. And now I think we are going back to the debunking issue with Mr. Matthew Fasheni with the research about playing Gali Fakta inoculates Indonesian participants against false information. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Matthew Fasciani. I am a sociologist from the University of Notre Dame in the United States. So uh, basically on the other side of the globe, this is my first time ever in Indonesia. So it's really great to be here. Uh, thank you all to the organizers for setting up this great conference and the previous presenters for talking about such interesting research. And I'm really excited to talk to you all about my research, which is this game that we've been working on called Gali Fakta. That is a media literacy game that teaches people different lessons and has some encouraging results that can actually help them uh, against, uh, protect them against misinformation. So very briefly, why do people believe and share misinformation? Well, one perspective is to think about the social and emotional components that relate to how people process information, uh, specifically identities. So when we have an important identity, we're motivated to protect that identity and we're biased in a way that we process information that supports that identity. And then this can be uh, amplified by trying to affirm it through ideologically congruent networks or social media or other people that share our identities with us. So there's a lot of research talking about echo chambers, how this uh, accelerates that process. Uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, I could even write a book about this. In fact, I did write a book all about this topic. Uh, it's called Misguided. It comes out next uh, in this year where I talk about how identities and social networks impact how we are susceptible to misinformation. But for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the other big component of why we are susceptible to misinformation, and that is this deficit in media and information literacy. So media and information literacy is very important. And when we think about media literacy, it's first important to think about what are we even talking about and define uh, the term of media literacy. So what I mean by that is just the ability to critically evaluate information so examples of this are verifying the credibility of the source, identify manipulation techniques, and even be aware of our own biases. And when people have higher degrees of media literacy, not only do they process information in a way that is more factual, but it also predicts different uh, public health behaviors as well, such as adhering to public health guidelines, uh, which we saw during COVID-19. Uh, another important fact is that most people actually overestimate their own media literacy and ability to detect fake news. So it's important to teach people uh, their limitations and where they stand as far as uh, being able to discern truth from fiction. Now, there are some very effective techniques for improving this. One of those ways is to simply teach people in a classroom setting how to learn different media literacy skills. And there's lots of research showing that whenever people attend these classroom settings or uh, do any of these workshops, it can help them uh, detect false headlines better. But this is really resource intensive. It takes a long time to actually sit in a class for several weeks and learn all of these skills. So a lot of researchers have been trying to gamify media literacy by developing what's called these pre-bunking games. So instead of debunking the misinformation after you're exposed to it, the idea is to teach people these techniques ahead of time so they can recognize misinformation when they encounter it online or in any situation. Another way to think about this uh, is inoculating people. So this idea of psychological inoculation is this analogy where you're teaching people about the misinformation before they're exposed to it so they're better protected against it. So these pre-bunking games are an effective way to do that. Uh, another way to think about uh, gamifying media literacy is providing these simple accuracy nudges, just reminding people to be more accurate, more thoughtful before they share something online. And this can uh, reduce the spread of misinformation online. And whenever we combine multiple approaches, that actually might be most effective. So 
one of the limitations of all of these media literacy games is they tend to focus on Western English-speaking samples. In fact, one report suggests that over 80% of the research of media literacy interventions focuses on these samples. So, as we know, other countries have very different political and media environments. They, the populations may use very different social media sites. So it's important to calibrate the media literacy interventions in a way that fits the context to make them more effective. So we developed a media literacy intervention specifically for Indonesia called Galifakta. So we partnered with Moonshot and IREX to create this Galifakta game, which is just a five minute uh, game you can play on the internet. It's a simulated WhatsApp style game where you have friends and family share misinformation with you in that WhatsApp uh, game. So you might be familiar with this in real life, but this is a way that you can actually see this in a game setting, and then you can respond to them and learn about the different types of misinformation and how we can better protect our friends and family against it. So specifically in the game, you learn about fake social media accounts, confirmation bias, uh, untrustworthy sources, and filter bubbles. So basically the game looks like this. Uh, one example is your friend shares you this uh, unreliable source of this tiger running around Jakarta, and they say that they're really scared and they're afraid to miss work. Like, do you think this might be true? And you have the option to say yes or no based on the information they provided. So here, the, the source doesn't look very reliable. Uh, that picture doesn't look like it's in the city. So you might say, well, I don't think this is true. And if you say that, then you get more points and you learn why that was the correct answer. So again, in this particular example, it only cites rumors. It doesn't uh, contain any official sources. And the image is old and not even in the city. So you learn different types of misinformation techniques and how to combat it as you play the game. So we wanted to test, okay, well, does this actually help people identify misinformation? And then how does this game compare to other media literacy games? So our first study, we wanted to test if playing Gali Fakta will increase the skepticism of false headlines and if it will decrease the likelihood of sharing false headlines. Uh, the methods uh, were pretty straightforward. We had a thousand people, uh, Indonesian participants. They were either playing Gali Fakta or Tetris as a control condition. And after they played either game, they evaluated seven real and seven false headlines that we found from social media. So real contain accurate information, false headlines or hoaxes or contain inaccurate information. And we also asked them how likely they are to share it as well. So what did we find? Well, we actually found that those who played Gali Fakta increased their skepticism of false headlines, but did not increase their skepticism of the real headlines. So you can see here, uh, the x-axis in the bottom is overall skepticism. Those in the uh, Gali Fakta condition increased their skepticism for those, real, uh, for those false news headlines, but not for real news headlines. So people were more skeptical of the false information, which is really encouraging to see just from playing this game. We found a similar pattern for sharing intent. Those in the Gali Fakta condition we were less likely to share false information compared to those who are in the control condition, which again was just playing a game of Tetris. So our preliminary results were encouraging. We found that Gali Fakta significantly increases the skepticism of false headlines and decreases the intent to share them. And people who played Gali Fakta did not significantly increase their skepticism of real headlines or intent to share those. But we wanted to take this a step further and test it. If it how does it fare against other media literacy games? And does it translate to another population outside of Indonesia? So in a second study, we compared Gali Fakta to Harmony Square, which is a popular media literacy game. And in this particular game, you learn different manipulation techniques by pretending to be this chief disinformation officer of this fictitious town called Harmony Square. And you disrupt Harmony Square by trolling and spreading all sorts of misinformation and just causing havoc in the town by posting these various social media posts of disinformation. So that is how you learn the different techniques. So as you can see, this you learn uh, trolling in this instance and 
it's a, a fun way to try to learn the manipulation techniques, but it's a little different than our game that focuses more on countering misinformation directly from people that are sharing it with you. And we thought that Galifacto was actually more of an accuracy nudge. And as I mentioned before, reminding people to be accurate uh, is effective in, by itself, and combining different interventions together may be even more effective. So we were curious if this made a difference in comparison to Harmony Square. So we thought both games would improve sharing discernment, so discerning true versus false um, headlines. And we also thought that Golly Fakta might actually be more effective than Harmony Square because it has that accuracy nudge component as well. So again, we're talking about discernment here, so being able to discern true versus false headlines. The methods were similar to the first study. We had um, about 800 people in each group, so we had American and Indonesian participants here. So we translated Gali Fakta in English, and we translated Harmony Square into Bahasa in Indonesian. And then this study, they were randomly assigned to one of three conditions. Uh, Gali Fakta, Harmony Square, or Tetris. And after that, they evaluated nine real and nine false headlines. Uh, this was a different group of headlines in the first study. The English sample saw headlines from the misinformation susceptibility test, and the Indonesian sample saw headlines from uh, Mifindo, so stories that are fact-checked by Mifindo. Okay. We also uh, had participants evaluate how they felt about the games, if they enjoyed them, if they felt tired from them, and if they were likely to share them with other people. Uh, importantly, for this study, we, we looked at a stricter measure of how people evaluated the headlines called discernment. So this subtracts the overall rating of false headlines minus true headlines to give you a difference score. And this is stricter because if people are just being more skeptical of both true and false headlines, then that wouldn't be uh, discerning between true and false. So you want the, uh, the increased skepticism to be higher in the false headlines group compared to the true headlines, because if people are just skeptical of everything, then that may not be as helpful. So this is seeing if people are especially focused on false headlines. In the United States sample, we do see that playing Gali Fakta was actually improved uh, accuracy discernment compared to Tetris, and this was not the case for Harmony Square. For sharing discernment, we see that both Gali Fakta and Harmony Square uh, fared better than Tetris and had similar uh, results there. So our hypotheses were supported that sharing and discernment was found in, in both games, but Gali Fakta fared better for accuracy discernment. When we looked at subjective evaluations here, we found that Harmony Square made participants feel more tired, they felt more emotion, and as far as enjoyment levels, uh, Tetris was found most enjoyable. Not surprising, it's a fun game. But importantly, if you look at these yellow bars of enjoyment, people generally enjoyed playing all three of these games. So next, we have our Indonesian sample, and we found that neither Gali Fakta nor Harmony Square improve accuracy discernment. It was slightly higher, but not quite statistically significant. Uh, same with sharing discernment. So Gali Fakta and Harmony Square were slightly higher, but not statistically significant than playing Tetris. But when we look at this a little bit more detailed, we find that participants who played Gali Fakta were more skeptical of false headlines and were less likely to share them, but they were also more skeptical of true headlines and were less likely to share those. So again, because we're looking at discernment, the overall measure, this is actually a null effect, but people were more skeptical of everything in this Indonesian sample. When we looked at Harmony Square, there was no increases of skepticism at all. So again, that's also a null effect for discernment, but it's important to see that people were more skeptical in the Gali Fakta condition. When we looked at subjective evaluations, we also see that Harmony Square again caused more fatigue, was more emotional, and we see that Gali Fakta in this condition, with this group of participants, they were more likely to share it with other people, and they actually found it most enjoyable. So even more than Tetris, people really liked playing our WhatsApp simulation game, and they were more likely to share it compared to playing Harmony Square. So overall, our conclusions in our first study, we find that participants who played Gali Fakta 
improve their ability to detect misinformation and decrease their intent to share it. When we looked at the second study that compared Galifakta with Harmony Square, we found that Galifakta improved accuracy and sharing discernment in an American sample, but in the Indonesian sample, uh, Galifakta increased overall skepticism for both true and false headlines. When we looked at the subjective evaluations, we found that both American and Indonesian samples found Galifakta less tiring to play. And in the, in, in the Indonesian sample, they found Galifakta uh, as a game that they would be more likely to share with friends and family, and they also found it more enjoyable. So overall, we think that Galifakta offers a scalable and cost-effective intervention to improve media literacy. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Precisely 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, before I invite our last presenter, um, I'd like to wrap up a little bit. So we discuss about how can we analyze. Uh, so you are analyzing uh, Galifakta as um, one of the pre-banking effort in Indonesia, and you're trying to comparing with Harmony Square that already used in America. Am I right? And the UK. Yeah. And the UK. Okay. Okay, we will talk about this uh, later. So uh, now I'd like to invite our last presenter, Miss Elsa Hestriana. Okay, are you ready, Miss Hestriana? Yeah, can you hear me right? Uh, I just maybe, put a headset. But. Uh, yeah, it's clear. If possible, could you make it um, uh, your voice a little bit louder? Bigger? Yes. Uh, Tess, can you try to speak? Tess? Hi. Um, is it okay? Okay, is it I think it's enough? okay. Yes, it's enough. Thank you, Ms. Hesriani. So, uh, okay. the stage. Yeah, I can hear myself in the room. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, is my PowerPoint yes. up? Um, um, oh, I cannot see it. Not yet. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on progress, miss? No worries. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for not being able to be there in person, but uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for making this uh, um, uh, possible to present remotely. And also thank you for the participants and my fellow panelists. It's been a great conference. Is it possible because of the pin? Because you pin the speaker? Okay, yeah, now we can see your slides and you can start, Mrs. Diana. Okay. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, so this is my paper on uh, looking into uh, strategies against disinformation beyond media, liter media literacy. Uh, so next, um, uh, basically this paper is um, triggered by two things. First of all, is the advancement of digital technologies that makes um, fake news is harder to distinguish and also the debate uh, behind media literacy as one of the most popular method uh, against disinformation. But then at the same time, a lot of people have criticized it as lacking uh, the ability to address the psychological and social identity-based factors that influence one's ability to distinguish truth and fake news. Uh, next. And so this brings back to our fundamental questions. Um, can next until all the squares showed up. So this is what then make, uh, becomes the, um, uh, the research questions of my paper. So what is exactly, what is actually the effective strategy to counter election disinformation if it's not media literacy? Uh, next. So in finding the answer to this, um, 
I was using the rapid evidence assessment. So rapid evidence assessment or REA itself is pretty similar to literature review and systematic review. Uh, it is piloted by the UK Parliament alongside with the UK universities as a means to improve informed decision making within the UK Parliament and civil service. Uh, it is designed to provide a more structured and rigorous search and evaluation of evidence compared to a, a literature review, but it's not as exhaustive as a systematic review. And so this uh, REA itself is followed a systematic review protocol, which includes um, relevant keywords and then includes criteria to make sure that the most relevant evidence um, is included in the synthesis to answer those questions. Uh, now next, um, uh, next, uh, so this is basically the assessment scope that allows the formulation of these keywords that is then deployed to search databases so, so that we could find the most relevant evidence. Next, um, so this REA used three uh, search database, Scopus, Web of Science and ProQuest. Um, and then uh, also and then, so the explanation of why the search database were selected can be found more, more detailed in the paper. I'm not going to bore you with this uh, very technical, uh, very technical elaboration. But then, so what happened to those search results that was collected from, uh, from these databases, it was then um, determine which one is the most relevant evidence through technical criteria and also a set of substantive criteria. Um, next, and so this basically uh, gives you a picture of the process of how uh, from those first hits of search results and then uh, we ended up with 27 core papers to include for synthesis. So you can, as you can see there, there's a, a steps where um, the search results were then filtered in, uh, using the technical criteria, and then we removed the duplicates and then uh, screening took place uh, first through abstract screening and then full text screening and then we filtered them again by, um, uh, by implementing the substantive criteria. Uh, and next, so across the 27 uh, paper that is included for synthesis, it can be said that regulatory intervention, fact checking and media literacy are the most discussed. Uh, there is about seven intervention categories uh, found in across these 27 core papers, but then uh, I'd like to note that only six is going to be discussed here, given that uh, we only found um, one paper talking about filtering and it was deemed insufficient to make a synthesis out of just one paper. And next, uh, directly about our findings uh, from the five um, uh, category interventions. So on media literacy, basically different evidence suggests that media literacy has successfully improved people's ability to identify fake news across um, different age, different even in different uh, geographical locations. And then actually one research also um, uh, did what, what, what Matthew's research did, which is to gamify media literacy. And they also found that the gamification of media literacy successfully improved people's ability to spot and resist misinformation, regardless of age, education, and even their political views and cognitive styles. But then at the same time, um, there are concerns expressed by some researchers that says that basically media literacy does not only increase um, the skepticism towards fake news, but also um, true news or real news. So they express have concern. They have expressed concerns about how, in the long run, this could be a, a potential hazard where people just don't believe in anything that were told to them. And then another uh, downside to media literacy. It was criticized that. Uh, the impact of media literacy would decay over time if the individual does not actively continues and continues to exercise the um, the lesson that they've learned. Uh, and next is about fact checking. Uh, fact checking also come across as um, next maybe a slide. I'm not sure if this the slide has moved. Yeah, thank you. Um, so fact checking also emerged as one of the uh, popular and most widely employed interventions has been done uh, in many levels by different actors and also that now it has started to grow and fact checking has expanded to automated technologies. Um, however, uh, across evidence and literatures that we research here, there uh, there is 
there's just some existing flaws that is being criticized for significantly undermine its effectiveness. The first one is the speed and volume of uh, fake news production overpower the ability of human reviewers. And even when automat automated tools is, uh, is involved, the, uh, the sharing process of the fact checking result itself still typically lacks about a day compared to the fake news that uh, the fake news that they they fact check and also not to mention that the popularity of fake news itself is tend to be higher than the fact checking results and the second one is that automated fact checking has been criticized for its tendency to in bias in its claims as we know that automated technology tends to lack the um contextual, uh, political, and cultural background, it lacks that sensitivity that uh, could potentially misidentify uh, true news as fake news or the other way around. And then the third one, um, we found this research, uh, particularly from Medaris and Sync, um, they criticized how a lot of, so they pointed out how a lot of information, this information uh, spreads through uh, private platforms such as WhatsApp and um, in this case, real-time fact-checking could potentially lead to privacy intrusions. Um, some researchers also pointed out if the fact-checking uh, effort itself was done by government actors, for example, this could be a gateway of uh, becoming a propaganda tool for the government where the government is positioning this, themselves as, uh, as the arbiter of truth. And then uh, the first one is the success of fact-checking requires users themselves to also take the initiative uh, and to utilize the available fact-checking tools. Now, this uh, uh, this underlines, and going back to the importance of media literacy, where media literacy would allow users to know the right fact-checking fact tools they could use and how to use it. Uh, and next, uh, talk to, talking about the regulatory intervention. Um, so across different evidence, um, one uh, key agreement persists that regulating information to combat fact news should be beyond information and it should also uphold uh, at least three points. The, one, the first one is transparency uh, that refers to the clarity about where information comes from and why they receive certain content when algorithmic system applied. Now this later, the latter part of it also linked closely to data protection where um, given that now online political campaigns are largely driven by users' personal data, data protection has become a more serious concern and also with the increasing use of algorithmic uh, base uh, in political advertising. This issue uh, increased significantly after the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal. And then the third one is free expression, uh, where uh, a lot of researchers have argued that a restriction on one type of speech could be a, also be a getaway to uh, restrict other types of speech. And this becomes a more complex concern with the involvement of uh, automated content policy developed by um, social media platforms in order to quickly and sweep more swiftly take down um, uh, a fake news or false content in their platform. Uh, and next, <clears throat> on nudging. Um, so we found, uh, um, uh, two sides of nudging. The first one is the uh, the benefits of it. So uh, some research have found that adding nudges help shift users' perceived accuracy towards information they see on social media. At the same time, the experiment by Back and Coleman found that nudges actually result in reduction of the uh, sharing and engagement uh, process of the misinformation itself. And then at the same time, it also complements fact checking because nudging as a as a flagging effort, it's offers a faster and more efficient uh, alternative to help trigger skepticism if, let's say, fact-checking takes more time to determine whether an information is fake or true. But with nudging, it can sort of like first just flag it that this content may be misleading, as we may see uh, these days on Twitter with community notes. But then at the, at the, um, on the other hand, uh, some researchers have also um, criticize that nudging have about the same um, downside as media literacy that we talked about earlier, that general warnings do not only appear to decrease belief in fake news, but also factual news. And lastly, access blocking. So this REA found um, two, two, two literature that uh, talks about access blocking. One, it talks about uh, an internet shutdown that was uh, done in Indonesia in order to prevent uh, post-election riots. Uh, and the other one talks about account banning. So, um, 
So access blocking in general raises a serious threat to freedom of expression, uh, but at the same time, Buck and Coleman simulations uh, showed that uh, account banning actually successfully reduced total engage engagement with misinformation. Um, uh, next, there's just one point in the slide, but at the same time, um, can the operator just help pushing next? There's just one, one last point. And yeah, thank you. Um, but at the same time, uh, Beck and Coleman also criticized that uh, account betting does not actually uh, stop the spread of this information as its practice tends to focus on accounts with a large amount of followers. And so that leaves the smaller ones continue to spread fake news. Uh, and next, so uh, the conclusion of this research basically that ultimately there is no silver bullet of combating this information and every type of intervention has its own benefits as well as side effects. But we also found that ultimately media literacy is indeed a fundamental strategy that lies as a fund as foundation. Um, and also one thing, uh, one thing remains is that it has been a great challenge to find that balance uh, to effectively address this information without creating any counterfailing risk that we didn't want to happen. Um, but although um, there is no silver bullet in addressing this issue, we see that each type of intervention serves as a, as a Swiss cheese defense, where every, every layer of cheese has their own loopholes, uh, but then at the same time when they're being put together, uh, they, they sort of close each other loopholes and um, preventing to create that trajectory that uh, leads to a greater risk. Uh, but ultimately, so the ideal strategy to combat this information would be to combine multiple interventions and involve all stakeholders in the process. Um, next, just a little bit of recommendation. Uh, given the, the pros and cons of each intervention, it would be useful to conduct our impact assessments that to weigh the benefits and flaws of each intervention and make an informed and careful decision in combating this information. Um, at the same time, while again, it's very challenging to do so, it is important to maintain a balance between combating this information and but at the same time also safeguarding free and fair elections and upholding individuals' uh, rights. Um, at the same time, in doing this, policymakers must thoughtfully assess whether uh, new uh, whether new policy interventions is required, or uh, or whether the answer lies in strengthening the enforcement of existing ones. The example of this would be, for example, if the policymakers would like to address the concerns regarding data protection and during um, election period, uh, they do not have to create. Um, a new policy intervention, we just have to strengthen or optimize the current data protection law that ultimately um, uh, protect the individual rights of their personal data and what, what anyone does with or third party does with their personal data. Uh, that would mark the end of my presentation. I hope that's uh, on time. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, please give applause to Ms. Hestriana. Thank you so much, Ms. Hestriana. Yeah. Um, you present in the precise time as well. So uh, you discussed a lot of um, effort or um, activity to inter to debunk the misinformation from a lot of literature, and you use the REA method to analyze uh, a lot of effort. And on the conclusion, you also mentioned that there's no uh, one silver bullet effort to the most effective one to uh, combat this misinformation. So all we need to do is use a lot of intervention and yeah, you suggest that uh, it can be like Swiss cheese defense layer. Uh, yeah, that's what I got from your presentation. Thank you so much. It's such a insightful research. So now let's continue with the Q&A session. So I'd like to invite all the audience if you have any Question. Okay, maybe the first two. Okay, please. Let me over here. Check. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Shirley. I'm an independent researcher from Indonesia. So uh, I have been monitoring social media manipulation these days. And I think I found several concerns. First, about the uh, live stream content, live stream problematic content. So maybe videos in live stream mode and then they are uh, spreading disinformation or maybe even borderline content. 
And second, I also feel concerned about uh, AI generated videos. I mean like, who can tell in a quick manner that those are manipulated videos? And so, and okay. And another thing is that when I try to um, see the database of uh, fact-checking organization, I think what they are doing is they are debunking false information. And so I'm thinking, what about the borderline or gray area content? Who can do that? Because fact-checking organizations are debunking those hoaxes that can be debunked. Mm -hmm. But like opinions or propaganda, who can differentiate that? Who can debunk that? And so I'm wondering, maybe with regard to the development of AI-generated videos and content, uh, what is the evaluation that we need to make with regard to fact-checking efforts around the world and also media literacy concept? Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for your question. So it's about how, if the content is in the gray area, how can we debunk that kind of content? And maybe, yeah, uh, I remember the first presenters today, uh, not, not from this session, but it's, she said that if it's overclaiming, it's also misinformation. So it's, it's not always like literally false information. So yeah, how, uh, do you want to ask to all of the presenters? Oh yeah, okay, so any, maybe Mr. <laughs> yeah. if you like to. Uh, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I was, I was started because it was very a good question by Shirley and um, it has been uh, a challenging one, especially given that once we, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, from what we do in, in the Cominfo, uh, once we stamp or claim that this is a hoax or this is a disinformation, it might have some impact to the readers or eventually to the, you know, the source of uh, the false information itself. It might be seen as limiting freedom of expression. It might be seen as um, uh, 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 probably false accusing the sources of information because we cannot deny the fact that probably those who created the video or created the information publicly available believe that this is accurate because that there is some elements on, on that as well. So when there is a borderline uh, misinformation or disinformation, um, this is something that we still need to have a more discussion on, on how we can, um, we can, we can define what, what is disinformation, what is misinformation. So um, because again, if it's something a propaganda or just an opinion, um, it is very. It would be very difficult to be called uh, disinformation. Although it just just pop up in my mind, I think UNESCO uh, mentioned in one of the three types of information disorder they have uh, misinformation, something that is not intentionally creating false information. Probably that might be the uh, near uh, solution at this point to say that. This is a misinformation, not, not something directly hoax this information or even more information. This is something misinformation that maybe the user that not, doesn't know about this, the, the, the creator of the information cannot actually prove that this is accurate or not, but no false intention. I think, I think it goes back to the false intention element to define whether this is something that we need to counter it actively or we we play by ears if, if that's uh, something that we can use to address it at this moment. But Shelly, I hope that answers. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Srokarna. So there's also issue about the free expressions, right? Okay, uh, so I would like to move to Mr. Stefanus Wisnuwijaya, and after this, I will invite Ms. Um, Ms. Hestriana. Maybe uh, you can prepare to, after Mr. Wisnuwijaya. Um, yeah, and after that, the last one will be. Mr. Matthew, okay, please. Mr. Okay, thank you so much for the important information. Uh, do you mean that we need a platform to uh, differentiate the AI-generated content and non-AI-generated content? I think it is uh, an ongoing process to, in the AI research to provide a good platform and also algorithm to detect that this is an AI generated content or not. And I think it is very useful and if we are collaborating 
there is a collaboration between the Cominfo, Ministry of Communication and Information, and many research centers in the world, in Indonesia and also in the world, to uh, work together to develop an effective algorithm. But I think it is very challenging to differentiate, to detect that this is uh, real content or this is uh, only AI generated content. It's, it, I think it's very useful, very useful. Although now there are so uh, some techniques to uh, identify that it is AI generated content or not, but it is, uh, I think we need to conduct uh, further uh, research in this area. Thank you. I think it's, hope, hopefully it is an answer your questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I would just echo the, the previous presenter's comments. Definitely agree with that. Um, definitely important to consider incorporating AI in media literacy, uh, trying to educate people and empower them to be able to detect um, all of the biases within artificial intelligence and the challenges that come with that. Um, as far as borderline misinformation, I think that's also a very important point. It's something I think about a lot. And I think as misinformation researchers, we have an obligation to try to be as transparent about our methods on why we think something is misinformation or false. And also have a uh, a large degree of humility too that comes with it instead of coming across as like we're the arbiters of, of truth we're, more as we're trying to discover the truth along with other people and these are the methods we use to arrive to our conclusion and then through transparency describe our process of why we think this is misinformation or not uh, I think that would be helpful whenever we consider these borderline cases as well okay thank you so much so yeah the literacy to the public that will be one of the um evil to do so maybe uh i'd like to invite miss hestriana are you here yeah um yeah 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 um yeah i'm just echoing also the other panelists that it is indeed very challenging very complex no easy way to do this and i think that's also the task of you know, these information researchers and um, technologies to not think of the present, but always in the future, because it will only get harder. Um, but at the same time, I think I will also like to address that um, when it comes to fact checking live stream fake news, it's going to be very challenging because even we even without the live stream fake news, the fact checking process itself already um, sort of like losing in terms of speed. Um, so maybe in the future, it's we're gonna have to rethink um, how to change the way we fact check. Is it uh, by automating it? But then by automating it, there's also uh, the risk uh, that comes with it. Um, I think that uh, essentially, as a foundation, media literacy uh, is going to be media literacy and empowering the people is going to be the answer. Uh, okay, maybe we will get back to her later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, is it answering your questions? Yeah, maybe if I can conclude, uh, for now we still have like mm, no really, really effective solution for now. We still need to, to do a lot of research in the future to really, really um, yeah, debug that kind of gray area content. So uh, I will move to our second, are you, okay, are you asking question? Okay, please. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon, right? Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, moderator, all speakers and participants. My name is Steven Montesquieu. So, 
I am an international research student who is focusing on global environment. Yeah, that is not related with this topic. <laughs> so uh, my question is, how to raise our digital literacy radically, not just so like government, Indonesian government did. Because um, Indonesia literacy score in 2022 is 57.4. It's bad than uh, Indonesia literacy score in 2016, uh, 61.63. So that is my question because I think we cannot achieve Indonesian golden 2045 if our literacy, Indonesia literacy score is low. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you so much. The way you speak like, I want to vote for you. <laughs> Like, you're really, really impatient. Okay, uh, are you asking for all of the, all the speakers? Okay, uh, maybe can I start from you, uh, Miss? Sure. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure I understand the, the question. Is it an issue of scalability of media literacy or? How to improve it radically. How to, so independently. Um, yeah, so. I guess the, the, the onus then goes on academics and independent researchers um, to try to facilitate research in a way that we can improve media literacy uh, as independently as possible. Um, I think if that's that, what I'm understanding the question. Um, is, is, so it's a, me, a, me, a question of in, independence and who is creating these media literacy programs? Is that kind of what you're referring to? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure I was I'm understood. Yeah, uh, maybe you have an uh, effective way to raise our digital literacy rate because, yeah, in this postmodernism era, uh, yeah, Indonesian citizens have, yeah, I think, has uh, digital literacy lowest rate. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it's challenging because there, there's so many trade-offs, right? Like you can create a, a scalable game that's free and, and accessible, but it, the effects are small and short-lived. So it can reach a lot of people, um, but the effects might not be super big. Uh, another effective strategy that we've been doing is partnering with social media influencers to try to share media literacy tips to their audiences. So this creates a more diverse a uh, group of people that are exposed to these skills. And I think that's a really a big challenge is trying to reach the people who need the media literacy the most and trying to partner with different uh, organizations, influencers, and other groups to make it as diverse as possible. So really just uh, emphasizing the partnerships that we can form as academics and, and people interested in this with other groups of people to try to reach as diverse an audience as possible to increase media literacy as broadly as we can. I think that's important. Okay. Thank you so much, okay, please, Mr. Ruizno. Okay, uh, this is a serious question <laughs> and yeah. need a serious answer. So uh, from my perspective, education is very important. Not just to learn how to use digital technology or adopt digital technology. But the most important thing to teach the students from the elementary school and in higher education about critical thinking skills. So they have critical thinking skills on how to adopt, to use, to disseminate, to create, disseminate the information wisely. I think, I remember there is uh, Ibu from Ministry of National Education. She is already here? No. I think enhancing our curriculum from the elementary schools, high school until higher education to incorporate digital literacy is very important right now. And also to teach them 
to learn how to enhance their critical thinking skills. We have various background of people in Indonesia. So we need to develop appropriate content, learning content for them. And it is, I think it is a very challenging effort for us. And as a university, Prastia Mulya University always uh, try to contribute to enhance the digital literacy of Indonesia. I think we need to collaborate together amongst the government, also higher education, and also other stakeholders to uh, committing to increase the uh, digital literacy in Indonesia. Hopefully, this answer uh, the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wijaya. Now, I'd like to invite you to answer. Thank you. So, I totally agree what uh, Mr. Wijaya just mentioned previously. So, on top of what he said, I have two points how to radicalize the digital literacy effort in Indonesia. But again, this is my dirty desire, not my ministries. The first one is to overhaul the education system to foster critical thinking, exactly what Pak Wijaya mentioned. Because why? Um, we have a lot of examples on how critical thinking plays important role in uh, preventing individuals from being victim of fraud, being victim of disinformation, and being able to create innovation and do some breakthrough, right? So critical thinking, whether it should be, uh, whether it should be overhauled from the curriculum, whether we should increase the uh, teachers and educators' uh, welfare so they can focus more on the activities to educate, activities to nurture the students. That's the first one. The second one is to overhaul the digital ecosystem model business. Why? Because all contents, all um, medias and information that we consume every day is in a way driven by the platform's algorithm. The platform algorithm makes us stay longer and longer, uh, turns us to stay longer in the platform by feeding us with contents that we prefer. And sometimes, Things that we prefer may not actually be the best thing for us, may not actually be accurate information. So in order to have a better ecosystem to have our individuals, to have our society digitally literate, we need to feed, we need to consume a good information. And how to get there? Well, a lot of things to do. Incentivizing journalists and news media and all of those source of information to create a good, accurate, useful, productive information to prevent and to act, at least make the information that is not useful or not entirely increase our critical thinking and productivity to be at the least of the information we consume. By, by doing that, we can have uh, hopefully a better literacy and better productivity. That's my answer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sokana. So, uh, we have three kind of answer now. We can involve the influencers, and also uh, we can emphasize on the critical thinking on the education level, and also to improve our digital ecosystem. Uh, now, I'd like to invite Ms. Hestriana to give your answer. Uh, and Hi, you, am, I, am I back? Uh, yeah, you may also continue the previous answer if uh, you haven't finished uh, it yet. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe uh, I no worries. I think I'm just one? gonna. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm just connect because it's actually pretty connected, and uh, I don't have a better answer to what my fellow panelists just said about the second question. That, um, and I think for the rest, I'm gonna leave it to the educational education professionals to to develop and design what is the best way to approach um, uh, a long term way to radically. Uh, improve our digital digital media literacy, uh, but at the same time, very agree with the critical uh, that uh, basically as a foundation is critical thinking, and this actually relates to um, what I was going to say about the first question: is that it's not only about media literacy, but it's also about critical thinking, and that it should be uh, conducted 
uh, as early as primary school and it should be in, uh, embedded in the curriculum at the same time and I think um, connecting this to what my other uh, my fellow panelists just said uh, about um, removing that algorithm in the social media platform um, I see that the social media platform and companies can can argue that this algorithm and the information that the user receives is based on the user's consent because then they have look, agreed on um, giving away their cookies or whatever and that so ultimately um, critical thinking ability is going to be the sort of like weapon to fight against this you know debate and argument from the social media platforms ultimately it really goes back to the individual's ability to critically assess the information that they receive okay uh thank you so much is it answering your question okay thank you uh so i'd like to invite another audience if anybody has any other question okay yes please sir <laughs> the one behind you. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you for the old speaker for your uh, sharing session. Uh, I'm Izan from Monash University, Indonesia. And I have a question specifically for Mr. Stefanus. Okay, Mr. Stefanus, from what I understand from your research, uh, the research participant is student and they read a uh, misinformation tweet and at faster rate at four to five seconds uh, before, taking, before taking action compared to 10 seconds when they read proper information. Uh, am I correct? Okay. Uh, I am curious about what is the cause of this disparity between reading speed uh, between for the misinformation and the true information uh, if there's no proper research about the why yet, I would love to hear your assumption about this time gap. Thank you. Thank you so much for the information, the questions. Uh, can I have my presentations? I'd like to show you that. Uh, I would like to show my, my slide. Okay. Yep, and slide number. Okay, uh, let's have a look to uh, this is to this finding. This is the proper information, and this is the fixed informations. Yeah. This is misinformations. They scrutinize the textual element of the information, both at the fake information and in the misinformation. The difference is, okay, the difference is, is the time to decide the next step after they read the information. It is quicker. It is slower. We think because of the content in the textual information is different. Mostly, the content of the misinformation, especially in the title, is emotionally impacted to the users. But the content, the title of the content, in the fact, information, in the proper information, it is less emotionally impacted to the users. This is from our data in the 12 participants. 
Hopefully, it is answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the interesting inform, uh, questions. Okay, uh, Mr. Stefanos, maybe I have a follow-up question according to that picture. Yep. So, um, so when when we see the wrong information, we uh, yeah we see it short short right yeah short of time. Term. So, um, is it possible that uh, the participants see that misinformation, like they don't take it seriously, but they take the fact as a serious information, so that's why they pay more attention to that kind of information? Yeah, it could be because uh, mostly in the fact information, the title is so serious. And it, it is attract people to read one by one all of the textual element of the information. But in the misinformation, mostly it is emotional, emotionally impacted. Uh, one of the misinformation is about Piala uh, Dunia U20 in Bali. It is emotionally impacted to users. And they read the title, and then it could be it is uh, very um, very emotionally impacted to the user, and they decided something to share or to decide to uh, maybe they do they angry or anything. But proper information, mostly the title is not emotionally impacted, and. Yes, Mostly, they use uh, different type of words mm -hmm. in the proper information and in the misinformation. Okay, so the misinformation trigger the participant to do the next call to action, like share it or yeah, or right? angry maybe. Anything yeah. or angry. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Wisnu. Are we? So oh, okay. Yeah, now it's your time, sir. <laughs> Please. Uh, hello, my name is Shirzada. I'm doing a PhD in political science at the UIIII. My question is that how the IT technology uh, use you using and lab how is I mean uh, extract the um, misinformation or disinformation even in lab because we are human, we have emotions. So how the emotions of a particular perpetrator can be traced by eye technology? Okay. So we did eye tracker and also interview to the participants. What do you feel after you read the proper information? And then we also interview the participant but what do you feel after you read this information? Another information which is uh, misinformation. And they said that I need to do something. It is about Piala Dunia, uh, World Cup U20, which is cancelled in Indonesia. Is it true or not? But I believe it is it is true. I, I am emotionally sketched with the the event of the cancelled Piala Dunia World Cup in Indonesia. It is impact on them, especially for Gen Z. This is this is the content of the misinformation about uh, Indonesian World Cup U20. And there are so many hoax or misinformation related to Indonesian World Cup U20, and we tested to uh, the students, 12 students. But some fake information about Piala Dunia, a World Cup U20, it is mostly uh, an official information from the government. It is uh, yeah, they read, scrutinize one by one, and they they want to to know further about the information. 
an official uh, publications from the government is use different type of words comparing to uh, the misinformation one. Hopefully, it is uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, with Mr. Wijaya. So, because we have limited time, I think that's gonna be the last question. So, uh, if you have more question to our panelists, uh, you can ask them after this. So, uh, I'd like to conclude. This session, so we have a lot of effort to debunking the misinformation, and I think for now we kind of uh, conclude that there is no one effective way, but like to improve the critical thinking itself can be one of the basic for everything, and also we can use a lot of intervention to try combat the misinformation in Indonesia election uh, this year. <laughs> this year, right? Okay, so uh, once again, thank you so much for all of you already give active participation and please give a round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Now I'll hand back the session to our MC, Miss Johanna. Yes, thank you. Thank you much Ms. Dientia for the very insightful session and to all of the speakers as well. Uh, before we move forward, can I please request the speakers and the moderator to gather at the center because we're about to take a quick photo group. session and it's a wrap up everyone can everyone give a round of applause for the first day <laughs> okay by concluding our second panel of the day it marks the end of the very first day of KISIP 2024 but don't forget everyone we'll still have a second day tomorrow starting at 9 a.m at the same room and we will have the third panel the fourth panel and a special session so we'll be discussing about how media law and regulation take part in combating this information and there will also be a special session with very special guest speakers so don't forget to come and bring your friends tomorrow and bring like uh, some of your colleagues to have like more audience in the room uh, before we end the session, I would like to remind once again that all of the papers that are discussed today can be accessed online. Uh, just scan the barcode available on your booklet. So if you open your booklet, there will be a QR code inside the booklet. And you can scan it and you can access all of the papers that are being discussed today and tomorrow. Once again, thank you very much to CSIS and this seminar is hosted by Saver Internet Lab or SAIL, the Department of Politics and Social Changes in CSIS in partnership with Google Indonesia. Thank you to all of the moderators, the speaker and the media partner. I'm Johanna Parida and see you tomorrow. Thank you everyone. <laughs>